Hello and welcome to another episode of The Code of Career. Today's guest is Alan Buscaglia. Alan is a software engineer originally from Argentina, now living in Barcelona. He is the man and moustache behind Gentleman Programming. As a highly experienced front-end architect, he loves mentoring juniors and teaching people the best ways around making a scalable front-end. We have a great chat around things like picking the right framework for you, how to advance your career, and how to work effectively as a pair programmer. Today's episode is brought to you by my new app, Pinpoint. Pinpoint is that missing personal assistant on your job search. When complete, it's going to allow you to make data-driven objective decisions on how to choose the best job for you. And that doesn't just take into account things like money, also as well, intrinsic factors. Sign up to the waiting list today for future discounts and to beta test the product. Hey, Alan, thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing? Everything's fine, man. Here we are. <laughs> Super glad to be here. Yeah, great to have you. It's uh, coming up to Christmas now. I guess for, for you, because you're over in Spain, um, do you celebrate Christmas one day earlier than we do in the UK? Uh, am I right in thinking that? Or am I wrong? I don't really know. You know, I have been here in Spain <laughs> for the last three years, but I'm from Argentina. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, but it's pretty much the same. Yeah, it's 20, 25. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so it's definitely been a good week for you then. Oh, yeah. It is. <laughs> so for, con for context, week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for context of people listening, uh, Argentina won World Cup on Sunday. So um, I bet you wish you were in the celebrations right now. I've seen some of the videos from Buenos Aires. It looks incredible. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Well, here in Barcelona, because I'm in Barcelona right now, it was pretty crazy too. Mm. We were everywhere. There are, a lot, are yeah, something around 30,000 Argentinians here. So it's pretty crazy. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, if if Scotland uh, even qualify for the World Cup, I can't imagine what the scenes would be like here in Edinburgh, um, <laughs> but let alone if we won it. <laughs> Man, it has been really crazy. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I wish I could imagine, to be fair, uh, when it comes to any sport, uh, Scotland doing well, but uh, such such is uh, such is life. So um, good thing you've recovered from the celebrations in time to record a <laughs> podcast then. So aside from um, aside from being able to support a very successful uh, footballing nation, um, for people who don't know much about you, uh, do you want to explain a little bit, a little bit about who you are and what you do day to day? Please. Uh, so, hello everyone. <laughs> My name is Alan Buscaglia, uh, also called The Gentleman, because I ha run a, yeah, a YouTube channel and a Twitch channel and a Discord server that is called Gentleman Programming. And uh, I'm a lead software architect uh, oriented on the front end uh, for a company called Erudit AI, that is an artificial intelligence company. And also, having seen, I'm the author of a book that is called How to Not Fail Being a Front End in the Intent. And, a, well, mentor, whatever you want to say. <laughs> but pretty much it, yeah. Very nice. A man of many hats uh, in that case. Oh, yeah. I also planted a tree, everything. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So what, what, what's your story? How did you break into the technology industry initially? Yeah, that's a really good story. So initially, I was not going to be even a developer or anything related to that. I was going to be something around the social arts, like, I don't know, it's going to sound strange. I know, a philosopher. I, I, I know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> I had this super cool um, teacher that oriented me on those kind of stuff, and I was really into it. Uh, but then I also had this old Dutchy side. I really love Dutch. Uh, I have a lot of things, you know, related to that aspect. For example, I love keyboards, mouse, uh, any kind of devices. I try to review everything before I buy and also recommend a lot. Uh, and as I was a kid, I started with gaming, of course. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, I love my games. Um, I have almost all my friends came from gaming. Um, yeah, I had this, uh, well, my parents had this Dutch business related to selling, for example, TVs, video game stations, or for example, uh, mobile devices. So yeah, I was really into Dutch and this aspect. And it, everything started when I got my first job. Uh, they asked me, what do you want to be here? 
and I say, I don't know. <laughs> they tell me, okay, you had two career paths right now with us. You can be a front-end or a back-end developer. And I say, hmm, let's go with, for yeah, let's go with the front-end. Because I found that, for example, I wanted to be directly in, in the client, you know, eyes. I really like showing what I'm capable of and also that I could do something that can have an impact in any kind of devices, even if it's a desktop or mobile device, for example, a telephone or an iPad, you can do everything. And with JavaScript, well, you can do a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's JavaScript is pretty much the most versatile. I mean, maybe in yeah. combination with Python. I think for any, the general advice I give anyone, it's just learn JavaScript. If you can learn JavaScript or Python, you're sorted. If you can learn JavaScript and Python, you're definitely sorted yeah. in whatever you want to do. But for the front end, I mean, JavaScript is unbeatable. Like, especially once you get very good at vanilla JavaScript and then you're able to learn various frameworks and things like that. Because a lot of the time people are anxious to run into a framework and because they see all the jobs that you need to yeah. learn react you need to learn whatever and uh, they run into it but actually understanding good solid vanilla javascript is, it's like an investment in your long-term abilities yeah totally i mean there's the thing there's a lot of senior developers and i've been kidding with this one because i, I have been the leader of interviews of a company of around 600 or 700 people and I made in my career like, yeah, I lead like 200 interviews, something like that. And a lot of senior developers are just skipping the basics. And it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, for example, hoisting, super normal, right? Or closure. So some of those stuff, you ask that and they didn't know how to answer. And it was crazy. Huh? It's people that w was coming for a senior position, uh, oriented in React or Angular or whatever, but they just skip the basics. So that's a really good advice you have to done there. Yeah, I, absolutely. It, it's one of those ones where it's understandable why people want to get ahead of the game because the chances are the technical exercises that you're going to have to do to get into an organization, they're probably going to be in a framework, but you kind of just have to have the discipline to sit on vanilla JavaScript for a while. For me, like I preach this, um, but the only reason why I did it was basically an accident um, because I looked at, um, I wanted to rush into React because I used to be a technical recruiter before I was a software engineer, as many of the listeners will know. And so for me, I knew as a technical recruiter, hmm, where's the money at? Oh, React <laughs> and DevOps. DevOps, that sounds scary because what if everything goes down at 2 a.m.? Okay, I'm going to learn React. Um, but then I was doing vanilla JavaScript for a while. And then I was like, right, it's time to learn React. I'm going to be a millionaire overnight. And then I looked at, uh, I looked at a JSX file and I felt sick because I was like, this, this looks nothing like JavaScript because of the way the, <laughs> it was embedded in the HTML and I was terrified by it. Um, so only by that experience did I become really into the vanilla of JavaScript. So for me, it was an accidental situation. But um, with, if I'd looked at, I don't know, if I'd looked at something like Svelte, then yeah. perhaps I would have fi found it much easier because it's a bit simpler. Um, or even Angular, actually, where there's a separation of concerns between the HTML yeah. and uh, JS file. Um, and then you uh, you can kind of look at it, look at it properly separately. That That's why, weirdly, I find that, um, I mean, I was going to ask you this later in the podcast, actually, but um, from looking at your background, you've worked with a lot of different frameworks. And for me, I've used both Angular and React professionally. What yeah. would you say is your favorite and what would you advise for people to use? Okay, that's a really good question. And there are a lot of possible answers. That's the thing. Because, for example, you need to include one more, this view. You know, because view is, is, is the third contender, always. Yeah. So would you, you have say this... Svelte as well as number four now these days? Yeah, Svelte is coming here. And look out for Quick. Quick, Quick yeah. It's going to be gonna another say. one, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the main thing is the following. First, I'm going to do a recommendation, a more generic recommendation. Learn JavaScript, <laughs> as you shall say. <laughs> yeah, because if you learn JavaScript, you already have learned the other frameworks. No worries. Um, I have six or seven years of experience in Angular, Angular JS, and Angular. Let me do that distinction there. And also have a lot of experience with React. Uh, I have done some things in Vue, not so much, uh, but this is the thing. 
why I'm saying that there are different things that you need to consider before jumping in a framework or a library that is React. Uh, the thing is that it depends on the context. It depends on the place you are, because even for the different locations, one framework or library is more dominant, right? So you have more possibilities of finding a job. Like, for example, in Asia, Vue 100%. Like, go for Vue. It is the framework in Asia. Uh, another thing is what's inside your team. And I'm going to say this as an architect, right? Uh, that I, if I will have to grab a framework and say, okay, which is the most stable framework that I can provide for my company to reach objective, it depends on the context. And the context is what my team is part of, right? Like, okay, I have three front ends, but two of them are super junior. And one of them is a semi-senior. Okay, React, if I wouldn't be coding or mentoring, React is not the one because it's super flexible, right? And that's the main thing about React. The advantage is that it's super flexible. And the disadvantage is that it's super flexible. It's, it's a exactly blessing the and a curse. <laughs> yeah. Especially in a large team and a large application, it is truly a blessing and a curse. And that's why yeah. Angular is so great for a large scale project. And people are always disparaging Angular. And often when I hear people talk <laughs> about that, I think, mm, I'm not sure you've used Angular that much. It's just like, it's the cool thing to say that Angular is so bad when actually like for a large scale application, it's being opinionated as a framework can be good. Yeah. Uh, people think just because the for humans being opinionated is probably a bad thing because it implies that like your very strong mind you won't you won't change your mind on anything. But for a programming language, it can be a good thing. And if you're trying to run an effective business with uh, a code base you can rely on, yeah. sometimes it is good to be opinionated. Exactly. Exactly. I mean. That's the good thing about Angular. You have a really strong community that supports it, right? So that's the main thing. If you, for example, again, you have little experience, you may think, okay, Angular is not for me because it has a super high curable learning, right? But hey, you have everything in your favor <laughs> to go for it. I mean, you have a really good guideline. You have this Angular way of doing stuff that every single time you have a problem, you can ask for it and you're going to have... I don't know, one solution for it. And that's super amazing. Do the same thing for React. You have a lot of solutions because it really depends on your code and what you are comfortable with. But one thing I'm going to say, and this is going to be against my Angular genes, and is that in React, I'm more free to play with my knowledge. Yeah, for example, the, the first time I grabbed React, I came uh, again from an Angular background, and I, yeah, I had the possibility of using all my JavaScript knowledge. I created some custom hooks that I have never seen before, and I don't know how I did them, <laughs> but they run pretty crazy, pretty great. Uh, um, I play a lot with it to to understand React Basics because you also have this another way of detecting changes, and you know the the custom hooks. Or even the, the the hooks that React provides, like UC effect and things like that, that is the whole life cycle of a component inside, uh, and it was it was pretty neat. I, I felt really powerful <laughs> doing that. Uh, yeah, and that's something that Angular doesn't provide so much. I think it's really verbose. You know, you have to do a lot to bring a single component into display, and that's one of the things that also, for example, in my case, made me move from Angular to React in my company. I found that all requirements were always evolving, really changing, and we had to do a lot of prototyping, and Angular was not the best for that. If you have really strong requirements, that you know what you want, you have strong designs, you have everything ready, hey, Angular is for you. It's really robust. It has a really, really, really good structure, and you're going to have really stable right uh, application but with react if you have to modify a lot you have to again do a lot of prototyping because for example in our case we are searching on a product we have to test stuff before it's just saying okay this is perfect right and react gave us that possibility yeah 
Like if I was working for a, a large bank or a, um, or a large insurance company, imagining if I was an architect, I would be quite tempted to choose something like Angular, I think, just because yeah. you're probably not going to be... I would sincerely hope that a company that's in charge of storing my money uh, is yeah. not going and <laughs> messing about uh, with trying crazy stuff. But we all know what happened at FTX, so maybe that does happen. Um, but I hope my Santander bank isn't doing that, for, for instance. Yeah. Um, so it's one of those ones where... People are so keen to pick just a winner for everything uh, yeah. when actually like it's about picking the best tool for the job. Like uh, what's the expression? Um, if all you have, a, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, uh, which <laughs> I quite like. <laughs> That's a really good one, man. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's exactly like that. I mean, for example, we had the discussion today with my team and they told me, hey, but have you seen a kit? It's new. It's from Bursal. Uh, we love Bursal. That's one of the things. And not yeah, because the owner... Well. Yeah. And not because the owner is Argentina, eh? but because it's really <laughs> great. Yeah. It's really, really great. And um, we're using Bursal with React, with SWR, and we are in love. But one of the things is, uh, have you seen the spell kit? And it was like... I have, I have hmm. had a look myself yeah. as well. It is so good. It's really good. But it's the version 1.0. <laughs> and I wouldn't just put all my trust in there, you know. I don't know if you have, you know, the, we use a lot of libraries. Like we have a graph libraries. We even have our own gra uh, libraries. And I wouldn't trust Spelt with them. And not because I don't trust in the, in the framework, but I don't know if support it. That's the thing, you know. There are a lot of things that we are currently using that, I, I know 100% that they are not supported by Svelte. And that got many wings. Mm. Do you know what? I faced a very similar issue recently because I was trying to rebuild my personal website and I was using Astro, um, yeah. which I, uh, have you come across Astro yet? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so for, for listeners un unfamiliar, Astro has the islands architecture. So you can basically pick and choose uh, different frameworks to use at different points. Selective hydration. It's very quick. It's very cool. Like uh, all the cool kids on Twitter are talking about it. <laughs> um, problem is... Um, the ecosystem isn't quite there yet and it doesn't have all the support you want. And it's just little things like trying to get a UI library to work with it yeah. is a nightmare. Um, and I, I, I was trying to get a contact form working and I was just like, eventually, do you know what? I'm just going to use Next.js because <laughs> it's just so much of a mature ecosystem. But, you know, in other situations where it's something less cri less critical to me, um, like, for example, the podcast website for the Code of Career, yeah. I whip that up in Astro and it's great. It's really quick um, because it's exactly what it was designed to do. But yeah, it comes back to picking the right tool for the right job. And I, I guess that's a lot of what being an architect is about. And we've thrown around the word architect a couple of yeah. times now, actually. And for people that are learning to code that listen to this, because we do have a variety of experience levels in our audience. You're, you're an architect. What, what does that mean in a software context? Like, what do you do day to day? What are you responsible for? And what value does being an architect bring to an organization? Okay. Um, if I was being honest, I always fight. I, I always fight <laughs> and negotiate with everyone. That's my job. So every single one that needs something from me, I'm going to negotiate it. Uh, I mean, that's, that's my job. Um, there's a really, really good phrase for, um, uh, from Uncle Bob that tells that an architect is not a guy that takes decisions. It's a guy that waits the biggest amount of time until you have the right amount of context to take the decision. That's the thing. So uh, that's why, for example, as you were saying, it's super. you need to be super picky with what you choose because maybe that decision is going to be part or have a really big impact across your, your application, right? So me as an architect, I'm not just doing diagrams and doing documents. But yeah, I, I do a lot of things. For example, let me tell you my day today. Meetings all day long. Yeah, meeting, trust meeting and meetings and meetings where I just went with the product owner, with the CTO, uh, with the designers, with the backend, trying to create contracts to check the designs if I'm seeing something wrong in a way that technically we can implement it or alternatives, things like that. 
Uh, so I'm always trying to negotiate stuff so we can provide the same amount of value or more with the minimum about, uh, sorry, uh, value, uh, sorry, effort. There we go. Uh, so that's the main thing. We need to find the value with the minimum effort. In this case, it can be checking a design and say, hey, you know what? Instead of a graph, why don't you use a table? You know, it, it can be that picky. Uh, but that's the main idea. In my case, I also work as a manager because you have different kinds of architect, right? You have an architect that is fully on the architecture, documentation, things like that. And you also have the architect that is also the manager of the team. In my case, I also work uh, to get my team comfortable enough while I'm taking all the problems, <laughs> right? So if any of them have any issue, okay, tell me what's the issue. Perfect. Continue working. I'm going to talk with the person responsible to fix your issue or, you, or unblock you, right? In the meantime, continue working. You are the one that is making the country go, right? <laughs> so that's my main deal day after day. I code, yes, when I'm really needed. If not, I'm going to be 100% of the time trying to choose uh, the correct decision that is not always easy. Also trying to check, for example, uh, an ask, because that's a really good one. Uh, you need to ask your teammates what's, what are the issues, right? So you can fix them. You can provide alternatives. In, for example, uh, right now, um, I was trying to migrate from Re React into Next.js, not that you mentioned it. And that's why we had this discussion about Svelkit and the sort. So one of the things about migrating to Next is because I want them to be comfortable. Right now, we have a lot of libraries because I'm super picky. And first, I wanted to grab React as a library, try to check which are the minimum amount of libraries that we really needed for the job. So we have something special tailored for our product. But now that we are in a comfort stop, um, position, what I wanted to do is to say, OK, what can I do to code faster and also be more comfortable with it? And for example, Next.js provides a lot of things like it has a structure. That's something that I really wanted. It has a really good structure. I am a, a really, really big fan of clean architecture. And I think, for example, with the new um, structure, with the layouts on the pages, you know, that you're implementing in Next.js 13, that's pretty dope. So I wanted to test it out. I wanted to document some things around it. And that's practically my job. While they work on features, I'm trying to see what can I do to make that faster, more performant, uh, bring, again, a, a better position for my team to work faster? What can I do to, to make their lives easier? Mm, it's a really interesting role in that respect. And another question I had related to that was, yeah. um, as part of your role, I, I, I guess part of it would... Uh, be saving the company money either through activities like that, but also as well thinking about how to run services more cheaply, I guess. And are there any yeah. strategies that you found that um, people can adopt either if they're, because we actually, another interesting sector of people we have, listen, are indie hackers who are trying to uh, run their businesses and services um, for as little as possible and on a shoestring to yeah. um, to sell on uh, because they're self-financed. Do you have any tips for people that want to reduce the cost of running something like a server or any kind of web application really yeah if you're using amazon shut it down when you're not using <laughs> it <laughs> that's the first thing that you had to do but let me tell you my story uh, for example in our application we're using amazon and previously and it's gonna sound yeah a little bit off but hear me out uh, we were using a uh, github with the github actions with jenkins and i don't know what else so we had continuous integration going on and with the Angular application, with the continuous integration with Jenkins, we were taking like 20 minutes to go into production. And we say, okay, that's not bad, right? But it's 20 minutes. And if you want to do a change, a hotfix, it's 20 more minutes. And if you are going, like you have Git flow and you go uh, from, I don't know, local to dev, the dev for station, station to production, you have a lot of minutes there, <laughs> a lot of 20 minutes. So why I'm saying this? Because time is money. I'm not even kidding. Time is money. 
and maybe you're going to lose a client because suddenly you have the feature or maybe you have a really strong position with the client and, and you need the feature right now or they are going to go. And that is money. So that's why we fall in love with Versal. The same amount of code with Versal, 50 seconds every single time. And the possibility of, for example, having a temporal URL just to show the designers, hey guys, it is correct. What do you think? That's amazing, right? You don't have to wait 20 minutes to show someone or saying, hey, let me share you my screen and let me let me misguide you through my steps to try to to for you to tell me that it's okay, right? You can play with it. I'm going to give you a playground so you can really test. Uh, the functionality and see if everything is okay before going into them. That's amazing. I mean, those are the tips that I will presume. First, get your team comfortable. Try to minimize the amount of time that it takes to go into production or even deploying something in any branch, in any environment, right? And with that, you're going to minimize a lot. In this case, for example, we stop using tools like Jenkins and such. We are use, trying to use, for example, libraries that are free, like Husky. Husky is amazing for VS Code. It lets you run scripts before even doing a comment. And in this case, for example, for us, uh, we are using Husky to run its build, right? Uh, it's a lean, sorry, and to test our application and everything. So we know that we're going to dev with everything ready. So we don't have it to do anything there <laughs> so it's even cheaper yeah do you, do you run it pre-commit or pre-push because this is a debate that i often oh, yeah. <laughs> see going out for me i'm team pre-push because sometimes you okay. just want to commit something quickly yeah. Wh what side of the fence are you on uh, if you can pre-commit but you can use test script to skip it if you need it yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good compromise, uh, to be fair. And also as well, what you're saying about Vercel, like for me, if any software company was to come along and sponsor the podcast, I'd want it to be them because I'm blown away by how good their offerings are, both at yeah. Enterprise and for just every person on the street that just wants to launch some kind of project. Like it blows my mind how easy it is just to, you need no DevOps knowledge just to yeah. enable Vercel, just import your repo and it's like magic. And there's like four yeah. domains that it comes out with. Um, to map it to a domain is so easy. Like it's just, it's shockingly easy. Like it's to the point where it's like, this is like weird how easy <laughs> this is. Like it's not supposed to be Worth this the cat, easy. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the, the free tier is so generous, especially yeah. in the age of um, stuff like the huge controversy uh, around, oh, I'm forgetting the name now, uh, Heroku uh, yeah, taking away Heroku. its free tier. Um, quite recently and even then Heroku's free tier was awful I remember when I was learning <laughs> to code like four years ago um, whenever I deploy something on there um, the free tier it would warm up for 30 seconds so imagine being like a recruiter and in fact I, I used to have this when I would try and hire juniors as a recruiter um, they'd send me their portfolio of Heroku stuff but wouldn't put any note explaining the cold start thing so I'd sit there for like 20 seconds while the browser loaded I was like oh it's not my internet um there's something else here i was like this developer's rubbish like <laughs> they can't they they can't make a website that stays up and that's why something like Vercel is so good because it's instant um yeah like it, it's yeah it's invaluable and for i'll put a link in the description for people that haven't come across it because i genuinely think even if you're just learning something like react you will be able to get up and going with it it's super easy yeah i have one more recommendation that comes to my mind right now and it's catching and that's the, for example this this was the main thing that blew my mind catching mm. on the edge network from Bursal. so Bursal has the edge network that is again is amazing at this is going to be revolutionary over the internet and first of all your website is not going to be down like never uh, because if Edge, uh, sorry, Bursal is down, it's going to go into Amazon, and Amazon is down, it's going to be uh, going to Azure, and things like that, right? So it's always going to be jumping around until it's on, <laughs> it's yeah. live. And the other thing is that you can catch the information with just using headers. You can tell, hey, I want this request, but let me catch it for you. And that's amazing. So even if I do 100 calls to the same endpoint, 
uh, and you put it like I'm going to debounce right the 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 endpoint calls in I don't know two seconds every single time that two second passes right there that's when new information is going to come if not the edge network is going to intercept my calls and it's not going to mess with the server at all and that's amazing I mean that's something that we really really needed in an easy way and we have it so yeah. Yeah, for, for people who are unfamiliar with how that side of things work, it just means the server's going to be under so much less load, which is yeah. absolutely vital, uh, I mean, for obvious reasons, because like we were saying, time is run, uh, time may be money, but running the server is a lot of money as oh, well. Yeah. And it's like, the best analogy I can think of is making requests to a server. It's like, um, it's almost like revving a car. Like each time you do it, it's going to end up, to simplify it, each time you do it, it's going to end up costing you money. Like obviously yeah. it's a bit more complicated than that really. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, I'm very excited with what Vassell's doing. It seems like they never miss at the moment, like with what they're working yeah. on and like the first class support for next, like for the JavaScript ecosystem slash TypeScript ecosystem, it is um, the most exciting company out there right now, I think. Really. Totally. totally. I mean, the things they are trying to do with Next.js 13 are crazy. I mean, it, let me tell you a good, but also bad choice that I made from, from my application that was having React with Bit.js. We're not mm -hmm. using Webpack. I hate Webpack. I don't want to use it anymore. So uh, with Bit.js, we had the possibility of having a really, really, really fast compilation loads and everything. I mean, it's amazing. But there are some things that are not so compatible. For example, Storybook. A storybook, we're waiting into a new release to make it work with um, Bit.js and for example, we are not using NPM, we are using PMPM, and it's also not supported. So I don't know if the time we are talking right now is supported, I'm sorry if it is, <laughs> but at the time I was trying to fight with it because I really fight with it, right? Um, we had to skip using uh, story before now. So one of the things that they are doing with Next.js 15 is this turbo pack thing that is in alpha. It's not working really well. I'm, I'm, I'm 100% yeah, it's not production actually. ready yet, but it's worth no, playing right. with. Yeah. yeah, and really good. And the thing is, this is the revolutionary part, is that it's not using JavaScript. <laughs> it's using Rust. And this is one of the first ones doing this. And it's pretty crazy. The, the, the speed time is so high right now. Yeah, it's there really were some reports yeah. that it was like 700 times faster than Webpack, which yeah, obviously it was nice. Vercel themselves measuring this. So you have to take it with a pinch of salt, but it's it's a lot faster. And yeah. um, it's very interesting to see all these dev tools being built in Rust now. Uh, it's creeping its way, uh, I guess, because the mascot's a crab. It's side crawling its way. I'm yeah. doing, people won't be able to see what I'm doing, but I'm doing this weird <laughs> gesture with my hand that's supposed to look like a crab. It's crawling its way um, much more into the dev ecosystem. And I think we've seen it coming for quite a while. Like yeah. It's always been on top of Stack Overflow surveys. So I think this, uh, I mean, it'll be 2023 when this podcast comes out. So I think it could be the year where Rust becomes truly mainstream. I mean, have you used yeah. Rust at all? No, I haven't, but it's really, really crazy because normally as the technology is less in, in, in popularity, the people that want to try it increases, right? For example, Angular, it happened. React, well, now it's declining a little. React is declining a little and more people are trying to get into it. But Rust is something that is not popular and also they have a lot of people in it, uh, but it's super well paid. I mean, if you know Rust, the kind of positions, the, the offers they're going to receive are really high, really high. And it's a new, for, a new technology, let's say a new language, and it's going to be super popular in the near future. I'm 100% sure of it. I think something we, we should both probably say here is that, and I'm sure you'd agree with me on this, like don't learn it if you're learning your first programming language. Like it's exactly, a good yeah, no, second no. programming language. Like if you're at a point where you're a few years into your career and you want to add another tool to your toolbox, then definitely learn Rust. But like if you're trying to get a junior exactly. job, then probably don't learn Rust. Learn JavaScript or Python. One of those two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. JavaScript all the way. I mean, right now, and I'm going to say it, JavaScript is a monopoly, right? It, it, it's the owner mm -hmm. of everything. I mean, you have another thing like Dart and things like that, but JavaScript is the king and it's going to be the king. 
Uh, in reality, well, what about what, WebAssembly? It maybe won't be in a few years if WebAssembly gets yeah, popular. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's the thing. But for example, let's think uh, what happens if let's do like one of those Marvel things. What if um, I don't know, Dart is the new one, right? Uh, okay, all the browsers from all the world, from all the companies, had to change everything. I mean. That means money. <laughs> yeah. Not when I would do it. Uh, also, for example, if we want to be super clear around JavaScript, we are not using JavaScript on the browser. We're using a semascript. That's totally different. There is a set of rules that goes through JavaScript, and every single browser supports them. That's the thing. That's the thing we're using. For example. If you go into any compiler like or a bundler like Webpack or BitGS or whatever, it's gonna tell you, what do you want me to compile JavaScript? I want you to compile it to a SemaScript five, for example, or six. And that's because not every single browser supports the latest version, always. So yeah, learn SemaScript if you want to be sure. <laughs> Yeah, that's very true. And uh, people can have a look at in their configs about how, how that all works and any kind of bundler that you're using. And um, yeah, I think it is important to remember that like uh, sometimes we can fall into trap of like leaning too much into what the cool kids say on Twitter yeah. when actually like the reality of it is if we zoom out a little bit, <laughs> I mean, like 75% of the internet still runs on PHP and how many juniors have oh, been yeah. learning that, right? Like JavaScript, you're going to, people are going to be writing JavaScript for a long, long, long time. Like even if it's not the, uh, you know, even if the most cutting edge stuff starts using something else in 10 years, yeah. then you're still, it's a good idea to learn JavaScript is the headline basically. Yeah, totally. And one thing I'm going to recommend because uh, you were saying what happens, you know, the juniors, for example, people that are trainees and are starting this world. Apart from learning JavaScript, what I'm going to recommend is don't jump from one framework to another. Don't do it. Go for just one. Again, search your location, search the offers around your location, see what they want, and just decide. Don't worry. And for example, I, I, hear, I hear people saying, hey, I have four years in Angular. I'm an expert, so I want to try React. Well, you're not an expert at all. And I'm telling you this because I have eight or seven years of experience in Angular. I'm, I'm not an expert. I have a lot of knowledge, yeah, but I'm not an expert. I mean, every single day you learn something new. Every single day the framework evolves. It has a new update. It has a new stuff. Right now, for example, there's this big discussion around Angular and React, which is better and that the new version of Angular, for example, introduces the concept of um, components that are not obliged to use inside modules. And everyone's saying, they are copying React. No, 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 no. They are not copying React. That's the thing. In reality, they are like creating a, a module for just that component. That's the crazy stuff, right? Behind everything, there's a module. So you're still using modules. Uh, but the thing is that they are trying to make developers' lives easier. That's the thing, right? That's the problem that Angular has and is trying to solve. That is not difficult, but it's tedious to work with Angular because you have to do a lot of stuff to just bring one single thing into the view, right? So they're trying to fix that. And it is fast. It has a really, really good performance. And even the bundle is super small. I, I'm not even kidding. You, if you do things correctly, the Angular way, you can have a really fast application with a really good structure, robust, and also is going to have a small bundle. But you have to do things correctly. That's the thing. Yeah. And that's the great trade-off, right? And as we discussed earlier, then, you know, it, it comes down to you and, and what uh, and what your organization's goals are about yeah. which you pick either. And there's no, like, greatest framework. Otherwise, literally 100% of people in the world would pick that. And then our job would be boring, you know? Yeah. <laughs> These discussions <laughs> make things interesting. And so something I want to ask you as well yeah. um, out of uh, interest, because you're actually the first guest on the show who's uh, based in Spain. How's the uh, tech scene in, in Spain these days? Like, uh, if someone was interested in working there, what do you think the future outlook's like? And um, how is it, basically? Okay. That's the thing. I have worked for 
Spanish companies. Right now, my current company is located in Miami, uh, mm -hmm. but but I have worked with Spanish companies and it's different. <laughs> Let me tell you that it's different. And not in a bad way, like totally not in a bad way. I mean, in Spain, we're trying to do things uh, a little bit similar that, how can I say this? For example, we have this half day work days on Fridays, you know, where you leave the office at 3 p.m. So it's really humane, right? It's really trying to get the developer in a really comfortable position. Uh, another thing is that uh, depending on the place, for example, in Catalonia, you have really, really big traditional companies. I don't know if a lot of people likes that. Um, I'm more of a startups. I really like startups because I don't feel like I'm the number. You know what I mean? Uh, it's just one more number inside the line. So uh, there are those kind of companies, but there's even a say that goes like, for example, Barcelona and Malaga, that are places from Spain, uh, are like the Silicon Valley from Europe, right? You know, something like that. Because there are a lot of startups, there's a lot of uh, companies that you can play with. And for example, if you are from Latin America and 100% recommend coming to Europe or trying to find a job from Europe, it's really good. Uh, you're going to find a lot of support. Uh, for example, in my case, they even provide me with a visa and everything. And I'm the example of that it's a possibility. You know, you have the possibility to do things like that. I can also, for example, relate that it's not the same amount of money that you will expect, for example, from United States, of course, because the cost of living is totally different. So there are people that are saying, hey, I'm going to go into Europe. I'm going to earn something like $5,000 per month. No, no, no. I think you're talking in the United States numbers, right? Uh, so you need to lower the kind of expectations. But I'm telling you, one of the things I really like about companies here, or at least my company, because even if it's located in Miami, in reality, everyone is from Spain. I mean, the, the CEO is from Spain. He's a really relaxed, cool guy. Um, one of the things I really like is that they're super humane. I mean, it's not like I'm ill, I have to work. Mm -hmm. My CTO, for example, is going to come here, it's going to punch me in the face and going to tell me, go into the bed right, right now, right? So those are the kind of stuff I really like, that you feel comfortable. So even if you're ill, you are going to want to work, right? <laughs> even if you are really feeling bad, I want to work. So... Yeah, it's a really good experience. I I, yeah. I think it's a relaxed experience and everyone will join. Yeah. Like great for work life balance and quality of life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I love you, the food. Do you here. get to yeah. yeah, I can imagine the food is really oh, yeah. <laughs> better than better than the food here in I love Scotland, but uh, the food isn't always the best. <laughs> um I don't know if you know about the deep fried Mars bars, uh, but there's a few uh, uh, a few stereotype food that can be a bit um, be a bit much sometimes. Um, do, you, do you get to work in Miami much in, in that case? Because I've heard cool things about the tech scene there as well. Well, there's a thing. I mean, for example, everyone hopes someday to be part of, I, I'm going to jump directly into it, Silicon Valley, right? Mm -hmm. But there are some strong things that you have to know. I mean, not everything is amazing. That's one of the first things. Uh, I know people from there that, for example, don't like Silicon Valley at all, that they have worked there. They have worked for really big companies and they felt like every single day was a challenge with your coworkers. Like you are trying to get, you know, um, in a better position always than your coworker. Like oh, you're it's competing. It's like a dog eat dog kind of environment. Exactly. Yeah. Because the cream of the cream is there, right? Yeah. So you need to fight for it. You need to be the best. And it's like you are always trying to be the best. Those are the kind of stuff that people tell me. Uh, and yeah, so if you're there, you're going to, uh, of course, you're going to earn a lot of money, a lot of money, and you're going to learn a lot of things also. But it's this thing going there, right, that I don't really like. But for example, the, the Google uh, workplace is amazing. You can bring your dog. You you even have 
uh, for example, really, really costly coffee machines with everything, you know? So everything is prepared for you to be comfortable working because you're going to be working a lot. <laughs> so if you can be in the best position as possible to, to do your work, that's what they want to bring to you. you. They have a really good number of benefits. Again, a really good pay. Uh, but yeah, you have to be 100% uh, available all the time to work. Yeah. 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 That's uh, it's an interesting perspective. And I think it's really good to work in different places and um, yeah. understand different work cultures. Like uh, it's definitely an ambition of, of mine. I mean, I've made, I, I've worked in, done Germany, london edinburgh although london edinburgh it's not that different really <laughs> um edinburgh is a bit more chill compared to london um and then i've done prague as well uh which was interesting mainly because um uh in czech which i didn't find out for a long time uh in czech the word no means yes so literally the word when they say no the translation into english is yes <laughs> and um so i'd like call for someone's attention across uh, across the office and they'd shout no back at me uh, <laughs> and it took some time to get used to especially because we worked in in, in mainly english but sometimes they'd speak yeah, to yeah. each other so yeah it's it's always interesting um finding these things and uh, the the other thing i wanted to ask you about as well is obviously yeah. um Outside of your day job, both of us we're we're hustling outside of our day yeah. jobs. Uh, what what are the projects you work on outside of your day jobs? You, you've got a couple, right? Because you already mentioned oh, you're yeah. an author, and then you have gentleman programming. Yeah, for example, uh, first of all, we have a Discord, a Discord server that has around three thousand five hundred people on it, and it's getting bigger and bigger each day. So I'm normally trying to help people. That's my main goal. I mean, everything I do, uh, I do is free. 100%, even collaborations are free. Uh, if someone wants me to create, for example, a bootcamp or something, I'm going to search for the one that kind of provides it for free for the people. So, for example, inside my server, uh, we have, again, from all these people, I was trying to find the ways to help. And in this case, we have two um, proposals that we're currently developing where we teach people... Agile methodologies, working with Jira, for example, in this case, Trello, uh, moving cars, creating their own cars, uh, trying to understand new technologies like Next.js with the latest thing and the versions and everything. And so we create working teams and they learn from a work environment what are they expecting from a company. Uh, we do those, those kind of stuff. Also, well, I do podcasts like you. Uh, I also have my YouTube channel where uh, I always try to give my experience to normal stuff. Like, for example, hoisting or closures. You can find 100 or thousands or millions of videos around them. But what I'm trying to do is tr grab that concept and bring my experience into the table. Say, okay, hoisting is amazing because of this, this, this. But watch out. In these normal situations, this can happen, you know? So, those are the kind of stuff that I normally do. And I work like 12 to 14 hours a day. I, and I'm even kidding. And I love it. I love every single second of them. You know, it's something that is fuel <laughs> to to keep living in my case. Uh, you know, for example, when you're at holiday and you're bored, like super bored, because you have to have this, you know, uh, times for yourself. But in my case, when I have this time for myself, I want to do something. I'm super bored. I can't watch a movie. Like I start the 15 uh, first minutes of the movie and I say, let's see the Discord server. <laughs> Just <laughs> move from there. Yeah. So yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult, but it's super lovely. It's super lovely. Uh, for example, one of the things that I really, really, really love is when I receive messages. The other day, for example, I received a message from a guy that told me, Alan, I don't know you, but thank you for everything. I found my first job because of you. Boom. That's it. You know, that's all. <laughs> I mean, I don't need anything more. We did a hackathon, for example, uh, the second ha hackathon from our server. And the first position got a job because of the hackathon. And the second position also got a job for, from, from the hackathon. And the, both of them went from, are from Venezuela. 
So, you know, it's complicated mm -hmm. over there. Uh, one of them, for example, was leaving, like, I don't know, uh, from charity. Uh, I mean, people were paying the internet, for example, so they can continue trying to work because they didn't find a job. And one of them, for example, had this super, super complicated situation where he was helping another person that was from Europe. And this guy was the one paying for his internet and everything. And this guy couldn't pay him no more. So he was in, in the limit, we could say. And now he has a full job position. He's super happy, you know. And you talk to him and everything changed. You know, he, he feels relaxed, right? So that's amazing. I mean, that's that, that what pays me the most. Yeah. yeah. Help it, helping people like when I see someone on the Code of Careers Discord server or yeah. uh, something, um, you know, find their find their dream job or, or you know get the promotion they've been chasing. And um, a lot of what um, my content focuses on in general, both in the podcast and then my own YouTube channel and stuff, um, is around uh, the uh, non technical skills for technical people. Um, yeah. So helping people that maybe struggle with interviews and that kind of thing um, is just so, super rewarding. I agree. Like when uh, when people are able to be helped and um if people want to find your content all the links are uh in the description of course um as well so um definitely people should check them out is m most of your content if i'm right in thinking it's spanish language isn't it oh yeah yeah that's the biggest issue here <laughs> yeah it's it's <laughs> mainly in spanish uh i i don't have an accent so sorry guys if someone didn't understand me correctly during this podcast but yeah it, it's normal in spanish because i'm trying to help people like people from Latin America and this place, right? To 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 search what they they want to be in the near future. So that's the biggest, biggest idea, yeah. Fantastic, yeah. I mean, we, we do have a sizable uh, proportion of our listeners um, who are Spanish speaking. So um, they'll definitely find that super helpful. Very interesting, actually. After English, um, the two biggest languages spoken by our listeners are Spanish, which I kind of expected, because it's obviously such a uh, popular language in the world, um, and uh, Korean, which I thought was really interesting. Korean, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I mean, hi to all the listeners in in South Korea. It's uh, awesome to have <laughs> you listening. But I'd love to find out how um, the content has appeared um, on um, yeah. in, in your Spotify recommendations and stuff, because I've never been able to work out how. But it's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. I, I mean, it's great. And let's do one thing. Just to, to play a little. Let's say something in Spanish for Spanish viewers. <laughs> what do you say? Uh, you offer it? Hola. Yeah, so I say, like, hola, me llamo Cameron. <laughs> Perfecto. Un saludo para todos los oyentes. Uh, you've lost me there. <laughs> I'm no, just saying hi to everyone that is here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That, um, yeah, that sounds great. And in fact, it is actually, it's been one of those goals I've had for years is to learn Spanish because it is a very, it's a very cool sounding language and oh, yeah. um, it's a very useful language. You can use it <laughs> in a lot of places. So um, I'm uh, definitely curious one day. Maybe you'll see me one day um, in your Discord speaking Spanish. That's my hope. <laughs> yeah, please. You're going to be super, super invited there. So yeah. Cool. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for coming on um, to speak today, Alan. I think I, I learned a lot myself um, from this episode. And I think if people want to understand more about how, uh, not just how we build things, but why we build things the way they do, um, this has been a super cool episode. And um, thanks again so much for coming on the show. No, please, man. It was a real pleasure. And I hope you invite them again. Please. <laughs> yeah. Anytime, anytime. And if people want to get in contact with you, actually, is, is the Discord the best way or should they try LinkedIn or some other place? They can contact me everywhere. I mean, uh, all social media applications, like I'm on mean, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Discord, YouTube, whatever. Just send me a message. I'm going to respond. Don't worry. Fantastic. Sounds great. And thanks as well to the listeners for tuning into another episode of The Code of Career. We will see you next time.